Well, a very warm welcome to you from All Nations Christian College in Hertfordshire, just north of the City of London. My name's Andy Dipper, I'm the Principal and Chief Executive of All Nations, and tonight we have a very special evening ahead. This is the 2020 Easney Lecture online, the first time that we've delivered this particular lecture online, and I'm delighted this evening that we have some very special guests with us to share on the very important topic of the impact of, of the pandemic for the mission of the church. Shortly, we are going to welcome uh, 
the Right Reverend and Right Honourable Dame Sarah Mullally, the Bishop of London, to speak. And we have a creative art piece from Endeavour 831, a theatre company. And then we have a very special uh, session from uh, Sri Lanka, where uh, uh, Pr Prashan Visar will be speaking to us uh, from his experience of particularly looking at uh, the response from the, from the young people's perspective, from a youth perspective, on what our actions should be in terms of our response uh, to our journey as people within the Christian world, particularly is in response to the pandemic. So without further ado, uh, the Right Reverend and Right Honourable Dame Sarah Mullally uh, is the uh, Bishop of London. Uh, she, probably for me, the most exciting role that she's ever had before. I'm sure she would agree. Uh, it was actually when she was a church, chief nursing officer. Uh, we had the privilege, my family and I, of being a close neighbour. We went to the same church. But it's delightful that um, her important role within the NHS continues in a number of uh, non-exec roles that she continues to have. Bishop Sarah is married to Eamon and uh, they have two children grown up and she is uh, with us this evening to talk about this very, very important topic. So let me just pray first of all for Sarah and then I'll hand over to her for the first of two parts of her talk. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the privilege of us connecting across the internet. Thank you for this session that we'll have this evening, where we really want to wrestle with these important issues of our time, understanding how we can be confident and responsive and providing hope in our world, where there is so much that has changed in such a short period of time. We pray that you will bless Sarah and Prashan as they speak to us later on as well. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Sarah, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, it's, um, it's a real delight uh, to be with you this evening. Um, and, and my only regret is that we're not meeting in person, but uh, one of the advantages of the internet is it does mean that we can connect from a much uh, wider uh, sense. Because of the pandemic, we find ourselves in the midst of a storm. Uh, and I'm often reminded that what we need to do as Christians is to take our eyes off the storm and place them onto Jesus Christ, who says to us, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Uh, I sit this evening in the middle of London, very close to St Paul's Cathedral, uh, where earlier on this year, I would have been ordaining 40 uh, men and women uh, into the Church of England. And normally the cathedral would have been full, but because of COVID-19, the services were very different. They're very small, only 30 of us gathered. And uh, in eight services, we ordained five men and women at a time. Very different. But the words of the service were exactly the same. And the words that I used in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of this very different environment, reminded us that deacons, along with all God's people, are to proclaim afresh the gospel in each generation. We are to proclaim afresh the gospel in each generation. The gospel doesn't change, the good news doesn't change, but our context does. And the last 18 months have seen tremendous changes in our context. Uh, and this evening I've been asked to explore the impact of the corona pandemic for the mission of the church. Firstly, I'm going to ask whether it's presented with our, us with missional uh, opportunities um, and then I want to look at uh, what it's revealed to us about the reality of a multi-cultural uh, United Kingdom. So I'd like to start by suggesting that the pandemic uh, is both a crisis but also it is an opportunity. Firstly this is a crisis in the desert. So in the midst of this crisis of the pandemic I do believe that the spirit is moving and that God is calling us to discern the new things that he is doing, and that in the midst of this wilderness, he will uh, make rivers run. Over this time, I think we've discovered uh, at least four things which lie at the heart of the church's mission, and which we're being called to do differently. Worship, care of the vulnerable, our relationships, and of course, prayer. So I want to start with worship during the pandemic. If a year ago I were to ask uh, the churches in London to put their worship online, uh, you can imagine what they would have said to me. 
However, when the decision was made here in the UK to lock down, to close our church buildings, many congregations quickly turned to technology rapidly upskilled themselves in order to offer digital access to worship. I was talking to uh, a young church leader this afternoon, uh, and he said that within two weeks, uh, they had put all their services online. And in fact, he'd had minimal spend. Their services still today is being streamed on his iPhone at relatively uh, good quality. By June, there were more than 17,000 online services or events that were listed on the Church of England's website, A Church Near You. The Church of England's national services uh, have clocked up nearly 3 million views over the last eight months. And, and what maybe um, was most unexpected, uh, unexpected was that about one in five people viewing those national services were those who attended church either infrequently or not of, at all. This crisis has given us an opportunity to connect in a deeply troubled time with those who may never have heard the words of Jesus, the words of his encouragement in the midst of the storm. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Uh, in common with many churches, St. Peter's is a church near Seaford in South Essex, the sort of south of uh, England. And they had a, a real minimal presence uh, online before the pandemic. Um, but when they began to stream worship on YouTube, uh, they found that they began to develop followers on Facebook. And their followers jumped from 50 uh, to 230. Now, St. Peter's is describing itself as a hybrid church. The rector, Arwen Fuchs, has said, I am genuinely excited for the future as we open more. I have this great sense in my soul that the best is yet to come. However, in the church, as in many other contexts, the move to digital connection has revealed social and economic disparities. A colleague of mine uh, tells of an Iranian refugee here in London, un unable to access the Zoom service offered by his church because he doesn't have sufficient broadband or data. One response to this has been the Daily Hope phone line, which offers music, prayers and reflections and has had over 150,000 registered users uh, within the first week that it was launched. Local churches too have found uh, alternative ways to connect with those who cannot join them online. They send cards, they make telephone calls. Yes, they make telephone calls by that thing either called a, a landline or a mobile phone. Uh, and they've organized uh, socially distant prayer walks around churchyards. As well as presenting new opportunities, hybrid church, a mixture of online and in-building worship requires additional skills and resources. The challenge and the opportunity now will be how to sustain this mixed mode beyond the pandemic. One of the uh, facts uh, that we found is that whilst our online presence in the Church of England has gone up, uh, we have lost people in our buildings when they were open uh, during the pandemic. So one of our challenges will be how do we connect those people who have joined us online to our communities? And how do we uh, refine those people that maybe we have lost contact with? Durham Cathedral uh, in the north of uh, this country has launched an online community prayer for its new virtual digital con congregation. Those of us who have only ever been involved in church uh, which meets in buildings, have become aware of the long established online congregations. There are many online congregations who have been there long before we ever found our way to it during the pandemic. And one of my prayers is that we will begin to draw on their wisdom and their experience so that it would enlarge our understanding of that relationship that you can find in that digital space, which is a very different relationship that we have either in our buildings or even with those some of those churches that have gone online. Online church is a very different environment and I think we have to learn about it and explore it more. So I want to now move to our care of the most vulnerable. Now, the Acts of the Apostle tells us that the early believers held all things in common and they 
gave priority to the needs of the most vulnerable in their society, the widows and the orphans. Our calling as Christians is to be in places where there is most need, imitating Jesus, who tied a towel around his waist and washed his disciples' feet. The pandemic has created more and greater need. And uh, I have seen the response within the church, in a sense, amazing, really. Uh, we offer ourselves as instruments to the healing of the broken world and our broken communities. And that is mission. Jesus incarnates the love of God through healing relationship, healing bodies, healing minds, healing lives, living alongside the outcasts, those on the margins of society. And therefore we do as well. The pandemic has challenged us to find new ways to do this. Healthcare chaplains, those that minister in the midst of our hospitals, have found different ways to minister pastorally and sacramentally to the sick and the dying and to those that are loved. They use digital communication to enable relatives to speak to those in isolation. Uh, they've supported frontline nursing staff who have found themselves offering end of life care without any previous experience. Our churches have supported the NHS in innovative ways. One church here in London who is based opposite one of our hospitals has worked with uh, volunteers in the healthcare sector during lockdown to pack over 5,000 personal protective equipment kits each day. They did it in one of the church buildings that wasn't being used because we were not allowed to have public worship. And they involved over 200 volunteers and at their very peak were packing over 6,000 packs a day a real way of showing incarnational love at this time. We also have an initiative called Love Your Neighbour. It started with one emergency pop-up food bank here in London uh, in, in late March, and it's grown to become a nationwide alliance of over 1,250 churches and other organisations, distributing government funding, offering crisis food provision, money and debt advice and also employment, training and support. A bakery set up in a kitchen in a church in Coventry, uh, originally set up to train refugee women in baking bread skills, now supplies its local food bank with over 250 loaves of bread a week. Wedding and funeral ministry has also been very challenging for us with particular limits on those that are able to attend, the need for social distancing, to wear masks. But again, again, our church leaders have responded with pastoral sensitivity and a willingness to be innovative into how they offer uh, continued Christian hospitality at those most significant moments of people's lives. As the pandemic begins to impact on many people's mental health, Churches are beginning to respond to care for people's mental well-being. In this country, 50% of us have said that our mental health has deteriorated. The biggest concerns that people have are hopelessness and loneliness. And the church has an opportunity to reach out. There is a church in Liverpool uh, up towards the north of this country who've responded by running an online course teaching mental health resilience. In Exeter, to the southwest of England, churches have uh, joined forces to combat isolation and loneliness that has been experienced amongst many of our university students. A church here in central London has offered its, offered its garden as a location for therapy and trauma, trauma counselling. These are just a few examples of the way in which the church has stepped up and stepped out into our community. But of course, whilst our church buildings may be closed, we continue to be a relational church. The night before Jesus died, he prayed with his disciples uh, that they would be known by their love for one another. Faith is not just about what we believe, it's about how we behave to each other. The challenge of lockdown and of social distancing has encouraged us to be creative in the ways that we connect with each other. We've had to work harder at noticing who is present, who isn't present, to find more creative ways of being inclusive. And perhaps this reminds us um, that actually, it reminds us of the power of the spirit to create community across physical distances. 
And maybe that's meant we've had to explore much more of what that means. The pandemic has also revealed our vital interconnectivity with those whom we previously have taken for granted, those who deliver for us, those who remove our rubbish, those who work as part of the supply chains. It's highlighted, highlighted the ways in which our lives are interconnected and the crisis has challenged us to value everybody's work, everybody's contribution in maybe a more equal way. The question it has highlighted uh, have also been those of social and economic justice. And in a sense for me, the, the default lines that have just been revealed by COVID-19 uh, should reignite our fire for social justice, uh, which of course is grounded in the words of the Magnificat, in the cries of the prophets. I met recently with some clergy whose lives were particularly challenged by the pandemic because either they or a member of their family were particularly clinically extremely vulnerable. And of course, they have had to take particular um, caution during this time. But I hope that we might be increasingly challenged by their experience. We should recognize that we have much to learn from those whose lives are shaped by the constraints of long-term illness, of ill health and of disability. Uh, they are engaging in deep theological reflection. And I would hope that we begin to learn from that reflection to learn what it means to flourish while sick, uh, what, it is, uh, what is necessary for true well-being, and the truth that we may live with our limitations, but still find wholeness and life in all its fullness. COVID has stripped us of many of the add-ons on our lives, the trappings of our life, which sometimes we've allowed to define us, our social lives, our holidays, our freedoms to shop for everything, uh, we want at any time. We've been brought to a place where uh, we have to recognise who we are without all those thr thrills, thrills, that we are that child, beloved of God. In services of confirmation in the Church of England, I use those wonderful words from Isaiah, uh, that God has called us by name and has made us his own. And maybe in the midst of this pandemic, we are better able to understand who it is that God calls us to be, a child beloved of him. And so finally to prayer. One of the effects of the first lockdown for some was an appreciation of a pared down simplicity of our lives. People have spoken about their spiritual awareness deepening during that time, perhaps because our greater uh, immersion in nature on our daily walks or that increased spaciousness of our lives with certain activities that were just not possible. Apps offering daily prayer or on the online office uh, have uh, found, been found to be of particular significance at this time. The Diocese of Salisbury, which is in the Southwest, developed local prayer spaces by setting aside outdoor spaces to visibly encourage those seeking to pray. During the second lockdown, some of the churches have been able to remain open for individual prayer, recognising the central nature of prayer, not just to our Christian life, but also our communities. We still have more thinking to do about the ways in which we connect spiritually with one another uh, as the pandemic continues to challenge our connectivity. But one fundamental resource for doing this is through intercessory prayer. Prayer for one another has felt uh, perhaps more deeply and urgently and more sharply focused than any other time. The archbishops of the Church of England and myself have suggested that during this second lockdown that we all recall uh, some of that fundamental uh, spiritual life, the fundamental disciplines that shape our Christian life encouraging people to fast and to pray for our nation and every nation, to pray every Thursday uh, and particularly to stand together in prayer at 6 p.m. I'm reminded of Moses in Exodus 17, uh, relying on Aaron and Hur to support his tired arms. Uh, and he raised his staff and praised, prayed for the Israelites in the battle. Perhaps this time of pandemic is teaching us how to pray for one another better 
more intensely and more deeply. And a final thought, uh, we're beginning to approach Christmas. The shops all, are already there uh, and so are the online services. This Christ Christmas, the theme of the Church of England's message to the nation is comfort and joy. Never in recent memory have we needed it more. The pandemic has undoubtedly been a crisis for mission in the challenges with which it faces us. But it is also a vital opportunity for us to reassess our priorities as we seek to be comfort and joy, salt and light and the yeast of the kingdom of God in our communities and for our nation. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for part one. We look forward to coming back to you shortly. Uh, one thing that you said that I particularly resonated with is when you said the gospel doesn't change. And of course, the challenge for us is how do we do mixed mode worship and Christian life when it becomes easier and freer to be moving around and interacting with people? Big challenges. We'll come back to discuss those issues a bit later on. But now we turn to a video. Uh, this is a, a video called Peace Among Pieces, Counting the Cost Through the COVID Pandemic. Endeavour 831 is an arts organisation focusing on justice, advocacy and empowerment, born out of all nations through the leadership of Vicky Townsend, uh, who is a former student. This video includes many current students and former students from all around the world who contributed to this. Waiting for an algorithm to define the rhythm of our lives. A line to dance upon a graph, then makes all plans capsize. This boat we're in sways sinking slow, up on the waves it's on. No Noah's Ark or lifeboat rope, can save the damage done. Upon our knees, we plead the need for more and more relief. With these empty chairs around the table, with eyes that cannot see. Little girls without a mummy, as little boys go hungry. Teenage hopes of diversity fall flat in flats. Fake university. Chemo appointment, funeral announcement, standby with no relent. Marriage at home, miscarriage alone, a red carpet's defence. One parchment paper, one mediocre version of events. Cold fingers curled, our fears unfurled, wrapped around our freedom's fence. The lonely and the lonely come, just as we are, we come. Now, to this winter, we pray, be closer to us. Your kingdom come. Strength to strengthen, the breath procured. Stronger than sanitizer, pure. Fall like rain of blessing here. You're more than a vaccine. You are the cure. A social distant society. Broken piece by piece. Please come. Respond. Be our hopefulness. Here, come ways on the vrede. Prong zoka, kobreja song ben satisuk kong ka pro. Señor Ven y se nuestra paz. Obreja nam santi su masurao. Shuyo watashitachi no heian don nakte kite kurasai. Obreja nam santi su masurao. Herre, kom o var vor fred. Lord, come and be our peace. Great. Um, uh, well, welcome back. And it's uh, what, a, what a great uh, clip that is. I found that um, very moving. What I want to focus on now is the impact of the pandemic uh, for the mission of the church, but specifically the reality for a multicultural uh, United Kingdom. Um, 
the All Nations College website tells me uh, that your approach uh, to learning combines head, hearts and hands. So as we turn our thoughts to how the pandemic might impact the mission of the church, particularly in a multicultural UK, I'd like to suggest that there are things that our hearts, uh, sorry, are things that our heads hasn't previously accepted, which our hearts are now teaching us, and that our hands need to do the work to change. Uh, and I want to begin by thinking about um, true multiculturalism rather than uh, silos. Um, I think we uh, used to think in our heads that the UK is a multicultural society. If you live in London, Birmingham or Leicester, any of those big cities uh, in the UK, you might assume uh, that that is the case. But a truly multicultural society is one where people from different ethnic groups have equal access to all of the same opportunities, education, employment, healthcare, cultural activities, being able to walk safely on the streets and enjoy the same freedom of cultural and religious expression. How we have lived in the UK in the past is mostly, I believe, in cultural silos, existing alongside one another rather than in community together. And this is what people of colour tell me. That has been their predominant experience. Living in silo makes it much more difficult to understand each other. It encourages a tendency to generalise, uh, to provide stereotypes, to make assumptions about other people whom we mistakenly assume to be from the same background as one another. Out of laziness and ignorance, we fail to really know who our neighbor is, though we might assume that we do. To build trust, to share concerns, to learn to understand and appreciate the richness of one another's differences and to be changed by one another's perspective takes work. And we haven't always done that work. So the reality of a multicultural UK is uh, that we ha have not been, in the best sense, multicultural. And the pandemic uh, in the UK has begun to shine light on this again. Specifically, the light has revealed that people of colour have been disproportionately affected by the virus. A study at University College London suggests that COVID-19 has replicated existing health inequalities. And in some cases, it has increased them. Social disadvantage is a major influencing factor because people of colour are more likely to live in urban and deprived areas and in overcrowded houses. <coughs> they um, have less income projection and the jobs that they do expose them to a higher risk of contracting the virus. In June, one of my college colleagues, Jason uh, Roach, wrote an article for a website of co-mission, which began with the wor words, recent reports around ethnicity and COVID-19 have surprised me. They have explained that black people are four times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white people and we don't know the reasons why. It wasn't this fact that astonished me. The real shock was this was actually a surprise to anyone. Jason says, health inequalities, ethnic groups is old news. In the past decades, reports have been produced by the government, by institutions, by businesses, by third sector organizations, and by the church, setting out clear evidence for endemic racial inequality in our country and of our institutions. Actions have been proposed, resolutions have been made, but very little has changed. This knowledge was available to us before the pandemic and we didn't do a lot with it. We've been told, but we haven't listened. It remains at a head level. Now perhaps the knowledge has pierced our hearts. When I say we haven't engaged with the facts, I am talking about those of us with white privilege. White privilege has been defined by Rini Ebo Lodge, the author of Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, as an absence of the consequences of racism, an absence of structural discrimination, an absence of your race being viewed as a problem first and foremost. White privilege doesn't mean to say that I haven't worked uh, 
for it or I don't deserve it or I don't deserve my excess success but it does mean that maybe I've never wondered uh, whether any of the things I've mi any, missed out on the setbacks or hardship that I face are a result of my skin color in a guest post for one of my blog sites in the summer, one of my colleagues, Georgina Graham, reflected on her life growing up in Britain in the 1970s. And she wrote, I was acutely aware of my difference, of my differences to, to my white school friends, not least because one of the dinner ladies called me the N word. And I told the teacher on playground duty. She looked at me up and down and said, well, aren't you? Even at five, I knew this was wrong. I chose to become a chameleon, fitting into whatever situation I found, found myself. And for a long while, carrying a self-appointed mantle of being an exemplary representative of all black people to all white people. The role was suffocating. I could not breathe for fear of not being accepted, for fear of being prejudged, for fear of being too black for white people's comfort. The emerging truth that people of color are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 coincided with the horrendous death which reignited the flames of Black Lives Matter uh, across the world. The confluence of these events seem to be, uh, seems to have precipitated a turning point and a deep stirring of hearts. My colleague Arani Sen wrote, between Ascension Day and Pentecost this year, George Floyd, an American African, died in Minneapolis when a white officer uh, forcibly pushed his knee into the right side of Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Floyd called out repeatedly, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Breath, the breath of Jesus, the gift of the Holy Spirit in his parting gesture to his, this world a symbol of the empowerment, both spiritual and transformational. We can not ignore the abuse of power, the institutional racism and the societal injustice that led to this ultimately and unnecessary death. We all are made in the image of God. We are all one body. The scriptures are clear that it is central to God's plan for the world that all nations live in peace. You only need to read the book of Amos to see that. St. Paul tells his listeners at the Aragophysis in Athens. From one ancestor, God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And the revelation of St. John chapter 7 gives us a beautiful picture of a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. This is the world as God intended it and heaven as God knows it to be. All humanity in our glorious diversity reflecting the glory of God. St. Paul's in 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the church as a body where every part is equal. And yet throughout history, black bodies have been abused and disregarded. People of colour have been treated and are still treated as though they are less important, less important part of the body, a dispensable part. Again, uh, Georgina Graham wrote, black lives have not mattered. They have been undervalued, underrepresented in the powerful and, and overrepresented in the persecuted. So what do we need to do with our hands? We need to build a society where everyone breathes freely and lives fully uh, the life that God intends for them. I know that I am a white person of white privilege. I have institutional influence. I have establishment power. What is it that we need to do therefore to build a world as God intended? I know that unless those of us who, who have those things that, that are about power and influence and privilege. Unless we acknowledge them as our reality and take action, then very little will change. I am acutely aware of the danger of virtue signaling. signaling. If what I say is to have any worth, 
I need to act on what I know about my own institution when it comes to racial inequality and injustice. Justice. If church leaders are to speak into a society about these issues, which I think they must, we must at the same time be putting our own house in order. Ben's Lindsay, in his Challenge to the Church, We Need to Talk About Race, talks about how exhausting and bruising it can be for people of colour to seek full integration into church communities. He writes about integration fatigue, microaggression, and the presumption, presumption of incompetence that is the experience of being assumed to be incompetent because of the colour of your skin. He comes to the depressing conclusion. People have legitimate reasons for thinking twice about pursuing a career in church leadership. We become full, full of self-doubt and often become disheartened heartened and reserved. This experience is echoed by Azariah France Williams' account in his startling, startlingly revealing book, Ghost Ship, uh, which is about institutional racism in the Church of England. This year, the Diocese of London, so it's the area that I look after, which is sort of north of the Thames in London, 24% uh, of those being ordained uh, were people of colour. That is double the numbers last year. I hope that it is a step in the right direction, but I know that it is only a beginning and it is not good enough. We began from a very low baseline, so we have a long way to go. Knowing this, we are committed to racial justice through three areas of work in London, education, empowerment and rep representation. We need to understand the scale of the pro problem, educate people about racism and unconscious bias listen more intently, change our processes where needed, and to be proactive in ensuring the involvement of people of colour in every aspect of church life. As an ordinan, Augustus Tanner Im said in a sermon which won at this year's Theology Slam competition, accessibility is being able to get into the building. Diversity is getting invited to the table. Inclusion is having a voice at the table but belonging is having a voice heard at the table. If we hold to the foundational Genesis truth that we are all made in the image of God and reflect that image in the world, we must recognize that, um, that until every individual belongs at the table and is heard, the picture of God that the church reflects will be incomplete, marred, impoverished and skewed. In an article about why things shouldn't go back to normal after the pandemic, a, a Durham a, a, a graduate, Dumbler Miller, said that his hope lies in the fact that we are starting to listen to different voices and that they are the voices of those who will enable the imaginative capacity that is needed to create a different future. The people of colour whose words I've quoted today are just a fraction of those whom we urgently need to listen to. They will enable us to envisage a different future, a future ref that reflects God's longings for his world. Then together, we must use our heads, our hearts and our hands to bring that future into being. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. You've <clears throat> left us a lot to, to consider and to think about. This um, is quite a remarkable time in the in our, in our world's history. And I totally concur, and I'm very grateful that you said it yourself, that actually we need to acknowledge and we need to build from here. There is much for us to do. We're gonna hear more from Sarah later, but now we're going to move to our next contributor. And I'm delighted to introduce uh, Prashan de Villa, who is from Sri Lanka. Uh, Prashan is an activist for youth-led reconciliation and Conflict Transformation, and is president and founder of Global Unites, which is working in many nations, particularly Sri Lanka and Myanmar, Afghanistan, Liberia, Israel, and Palestine. Please do consider looking at his website, globalunites.org forward slash team for some more information on Prashan himself. Prashan, thank you for being with us this evening. I know it's very, very late in Sri Lanka, and over to you. 
Thank you for having me. Greetings from Sri Lanka. It's an honor and a privilege uh, to be here. I, it's almost two o'clock in the morning and uh, a little while ago I was wondering, well, I hope I'm not sleepwalking uh, or listening to a very uh, good uh, time of reflection. I was so inspired by uh, what the bishop was sharing and uh, it, it's, it just rings true uh, across the world at this moment. There's so many truths for the body of Christ in, in moments of crisis and moments of pain. And those words of truth from scripture uh, echo um, across culture, across nation, across continent. And we praise God for that. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of a background for Sri Lanka, um, you know, our nation um, became an independent country in 1948 after colonial rule. And, and since 1948, in the last 72 years, uh, we have had nearly cycles of violence almost every 15 to 18 years in our country. Violence has destroyed this country along ethnic lines, religious lines, political ideologies, and with an inclusive Sri Lankan identity has eluded us time and time again. And growing up, I grew up in the midst of a brutal civil war. Um, and there were two major conflicts that almost defined uh, my identity. On one side, being a Christian, uh, which is by far the minority religious group in the country, experiencing uh, levels of persecution, maybe more so in rural parts of our country, uh, but seeing there was a sense of hatred and uh, animosity against Christians, assuming that Christianity was a faith of the West and that it didn't belong uh, for those who were free and independent Sri Lanka. And there was uh, attacks on our churches, pastors being beaten up, uh, churches getting burnt down, um, just because they didn't understand what the gospel was about or who Christ was. And in this, it's in this context that my father had uh, a calling to be a full-time worker and a, a preacher. And he decided not to do it in the safe realms of, of the city and in places where there was very little persecution, but he wanted to go to rural Sri Lanka and, and serve in that context. Uh, so I remember growing up, it would always be in, in prayer for my father when he would go into these high risk zones, praying for his safety and praying that he will come back. And always I felt like we didn't have rights. Uh, we, we were not, we were definitely second class citizens in this country. And so that conflict was always lingering in my mind and it, it kind of dictated the way that I responded. I felt we were not good enough. We were second class. We couldn't make an impact in the country. The second conflict was obviously the violent conflict between the ethnic groups, the Sinhalese who were the majority and the Tamils. And this conflict was brutal where it was mainly young people who were brainwashed and told to believe that violence was the only way to solve their problems, the only way to respond to their grievances. So we grew up seeing young people, maybe as young as 15 at times, wrapping a bomb around their waist, coming into the city, coming into crowded areas and blowing themselves up. Um, even I grew up with a lot of fear and uncertainty, but also anger and hatred. So these two conflicts and these violences kind of defined uh, my own identity. But at the same time, uh, when we look at our country, uh, we have suffered in multiple ways. Post-colonization, not just the uh, violence and unrest. In fact, some experts say we've lost half a million people due to senseless violence. Almost every 15 to 18 years, there have been cycles of violence. In addition to that, we've been traumatized by a tsunami that, that took away uh, we were the country that was most impacted by the, the tsunami that took place in Southeast Asia. Um, and at the same time, we've had uh, just 10 years after the war came to an end. And as we were looking to celebrate the end of the war, uh, we had the Easter Sunday bombing that happened last year, where people who just went to church to celebrate the resurrection of Christ died untimely deaths and gruesome deaths. And so it's been one traumatic incident after the other and then hits the pandemic. Uh, our, our society, our economy, has every, everything's been impacted. And all of this has led at times to a spirit of fear and a spirit of looking down on who we are as children of God. 
It doesn't say that we are children of God just when times are good or if we're born into privilege or if we have resources or if we live in a country of stability. We are children of God because of Christ, regardless of where we are, regardless of the circumstances. And he is our God. He is sovereign. He is seated on the throne. And we have the privilege to go to him uh, in prayer and also to uh, receive our identity from him as his children, as opposed to the circumstances we're currently living in or we have grown up in. And that's when I had a huge impact by reading the words of Paul to Timothy. And uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 7 and 9, where Paul calls out Timothy and says, Timothy, the spirit within you is not a spirit of fear. It's not a spirit of timidity, but quite the contrary. It's a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Now, Timothy had a tendency uh, maybe to feel like he was inferior or lesser compared to those in the Hall of Fame of the New Testament church. Uh, he was not directly associating with Christ. Uh, he was part Greek, part Jewish. Uh, and he may have felt like in the times of Paul's and the Peter's, he, he was nobody. But Paul is calling him out and saying, listen, the spirit within you is not timid, is not fearful. But what is it? Power. And this word is dunamis. It's the way we get the English word dynamite. This explosive power, the supernatural power that God has invested in us as his children. That yes, the circumstances may say that we are overwhelmed and we don't have the capacity to respond or we have no business even thinking of trying to respond. That's nullified by the fact that Christ invested his spirit in you and there is power. But it's not just power. There's love. The agape love of Christ, the unconditional love of Christ has been invested in us as mere mortals, but being able to love like Christ loved beyond our human capacities because of the spirit that lives within us. That is why I'm always amazed in the midst of persecution. I would go to churches that have been just burnt down to the ground, pastors beaten up, the women in the church threatened to be raped if they go to church again, all those fears. And you walk into the church and you would expect to hear anger, bitterness, fear, but every time I walked into those sittings, I hear these people praying for the very people who were the perpetrators for those crimes, loving on them, loving unconditionally, praying for their salvation, praying that God will restore their families and help them to see the love of Christ. I'm always amazed. And then I know that that's not mere mortal capacity to love. That is the agape love of God. That is the spirit of the Lord awakening them beyond their mortal senses to love unconditionally. And that is why we love. Even if we are a minority, even if we experience oppression, even if we live in poverty, even if we don't have all of our needs met at times, uh, or it, is, it feels uncertain, we love unconditionally and we support those in need. We care for one another, not because we're good people, but because the spirit within us is the spirit of Christ. And that's a love, that's agape love, it's unconditional. And then Paul goes on to say, the spirit of a sound mind, um, an ability to be set apart unto the Lord, not to give way to the ways of the world and just go with whatever works, whatever you feel, whatever you want, but to say, Lord, I want to be set apart unto you for your purposes, for your glory. And that ability to stand strong. And fear is quite the contrary. Fear is no power. Fear is helplessness. Fear is feebleness and an inability to respond. Fear is not unconditional love. Fear is selfish love. Fear is just protecting oneself, afraid to love unconditionally because you don't know if that will be reciprocated towards you. Fear is not a sound mind. Fear is doing whatever to survive and, and doing whatever to fit in. And so, as I read this growing up as a young man in Sri Lanka, I said, I have no reason to live in fear. God is calling us to respond. It doesn't say if you live in privilege, if you're in a strong situation, if there's stability, if all those things are in place, then the spirit within you is a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. And so even in this context, in the midst of the pandemic, you may be feeling a sense of fear. You may be feeling a sense of uncertainty, but it is at its very 
precisely for times like this that you and I need to be reminded of who we are. We are children of God. And we are a call to respond, not just to respond to our needs and our inner circles and our, our groups, but to respond to the most vulnerable in society, to live selflessly and passionately. Don't be overwhelmed by your challenges. Look to Christ, look to your eternal grace and love, and then have him guide you to those in dire need, those who are in more pain, and you would see comfort in that. And you would know that he has you here for a purpose. I've always believed that salvation is for me, is for you. But when he anointed us with his spirit, that was for us to be a blessing unto others. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are called to serve. And so that is why uh, here in Sri Lanka, even though we are a minority group, we decided to launch a movement called Sri Lanka Unites which is a reconciliation movement, a, a counter violent movement to help build bridges across ethnic lines, across religious lines, to be peacemakers. As Christ said on the Sermon on the Mount, the blessed are the peacemakers, but they shall be called the children of God. That is a part of who we are as fundamental, it's part of our DNA. We cannot watch our world being destroyed. We cannot look at racism and hate and just put our hands up in the air and say, it's none of my business or it's, it's too big for me to engage. That's exactly why we need to engage. And as we've done this, uh, Sri Lanka Unites has turned out to be the largest youth movement for peace in our nation. Today, we have over 25,000 young men and women across the country pledging to be uh, members and ambassadors for peace and healing. Today, we have over 50 staff working in 10 centers across the island in the very places. In fact, in our staff, we have young men and women who were part of violent groups before who have left those movements and said no to violence and now are part of peace building and healing. Two years ago, we had the privilege of receiving an award from Her Majesty the Queen, the Points of Light Award for the work that Sri Lanka Unites is doing. A small group of young people are now turning to transform the nation and young people's opinions on one, we have to be active agents of healing in society. We would not give in to extremism and radicalization and we will not treat people uh, differently based on their ethnicity, their religion, or their socioeconomic class. And by the grace of God, the work that we began in Sri Lanka today, we are larger than any terrorist organization or any extremist organization in our nation that's currently present or ever was present. If we were living in timidity, violence would have continued to have its way in our nation. If we were living in timidity, people would have continued to suffer in injustice. But when we acknowledge that the spirit within us is far, is far greater than who we are and far greater than the circumstances that we live in, there is immeasurably more than we can ever imagine. That's why we take a step in faith. And we could have said, well, this is good, this is good enough for Sri Lanka. Let's just remain here and do this. And yes, we're a small island nation. But the Lord started laying in our hearts, it's not just for Sri Lanka. Many young people are living lives as a, fearfully as a result of violent extremism and hatred and racism. So we started launching in nations across the world. Today we're in 13 nations and the head of quarters is in Sri Lanka. We have movements in Afghanistan, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Uganda. We are inching closer to 40,000 members worldwide of young people saying enough is enough. And yes, there was a time they lived in timidity and fear, but today they no longer live that way because they believe. And I should say that this is a multi-religious, multi-ethnic movement built and led initially by Christian values, but now giving support to many movements across the world. And during the pandemic, Yes, we are a youth movement. Yes, we live in poor countries. Yes, we too have our own challenges of how are we gonna put food on the table for our families and our, our relatives. But I'm so proud of our young men and women. Uh, just in the last five months, they have supported nearly 6,000 families in all of our countries, supporting them with or nearly a million meals to ensure that then they don't go into starvation. Because as you know, for the many people who live on less than a dollar a day, they have to go out and work to have that dollar to be able to feed themselves. 
and, and many were living at the verge of hunger, already struggling with hunger. But these young men and women across ethnic lines, across religious lines, going and even serving food to their enemies, to the very people who took the lives of their loved ones, to saying, we will not give in to hate. We will not give in to fear. And so in closing, I want to tell you, whatever your circumstances are, whatever you're feeling right now, if you are a child of God and if you believe that you have been blessed with the love of Christ and his anointing, whatever he breaks your heart for that you see in society, Christ is not breaking your heart to let you know that you have a heart or a conscience. He's breaking your heart so that you and I would respond in obedience. Let's not give him excuses. Let's give him a life of obedience. God is faithful. And sometimes you may be, I don't know all the solutions. I don't know all the steps I'm supposed to take. But as the psalmist says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And a lamp only provides enough light for me to see my first step. And as I take that first step of obedience in response to him, he reveals the next step and the next step. So do you have that courage? Even if you don't have the blueprint for all the steps ahead, do you have the courage to take that first step and respond? This pandemic has revealed so many evils in our society, whether it's how women are treated, uh, domestic violence, uh, racism and hate and inequality, the access to the health system and all these issues. This is not for our intellectual understanding of these issues or for us to feel sad about it or empathetic about it momentarily. But this is so that the children of God will respond in love until they see transformation that they will be fearless in their desire to influence and transform society. So let us be at his feet and say, Lord, you've broken my heart to now give me the courage to respond. Now give me the courage not to just respond once, but keep on responding with my life. Because we were called to be the light of the world, not the light of the church, not the light within a subculture and in, within our comfort zone. We are called to go into those broken spaces and respond. Not knowing that we are not the savior, Christ is our savior and we are his children responding in his name. So God bless you and I pray that the Lord will anoint you and renew his calling on your life. And may this be a day and a moment in the midst of a pandemic that we will stand up and say, Lord, here am I, I will go. God bless you. Roshan Devisa, thank you so much for inspiring us and for, for showing us that there is indeed the possibility of hopefulness, overcoming fear in our world. You're proud of the 6,000 uh, families that have been helped, the million meals. Wow, we are incredibly impressed. And uh, I don't know if the UK is one of your 13 nations that you're working, but we need you in the UK quite honestly. Um, we, we have lots to do together. We're going to have a, a conversation now and just like to invite Sarah to join us as well. Um, but I want to start off, um, Prashan, with a question to you. And it's really around this issue of fear, particularly in the pandemic. I, I really hear that you said that, that it's been a nation where every 12, 15 to 18 years there's been cycles of violence over so, so many years. But what would you say to young people today that actually means that we should be um, confident uh, about sharing the goodness of God, you know, especially to these young people in the midst of a pandemic and what is gonna come right next? Can you give us some, uh, some, some wisdom really on how we should effectively communicate whatever country these people are in? Is I always believe that when we see so much brokenness in our world, uh, if we are truly transformed by the love of Christ, there's no way we can turn the other way and say, it's not my problem. We have to respond. And you cannot give excuses of how young you are, how inexperienced you are, how poor you are. It doesn't matter. God called you. He chose you. You didn't choose him. He chose you. And he wanted you to respond. And so when we do respond, you know, uh, I, I always quote, you know, the words of Francis of Assisi, you know, preach Christ at all times, use words when necessary. 
in, in this context, I, I believe that we need to go in and be the hands and feet of Christ and build meaningful relationships with people and then never shy away from sharing the gospel and the truth that we know in Christ as well. But what I've seen is at times there's this fear to go and share the gospel, but first, if you can go and live life with them, do life with them, care for them, show that you are truly authentic. You're not trying to manipulate anybody. You're not coming there with an agenda. You're not loving them only if they do certain things that you feel that they need to do. You're loving them unconditionally like Christ love. And when we do that, then people become curious and they see the authenticity of who you are. And then you can share why you do these things. I do this because of Christ. I do this because Christ has saved my life. That's my, that's my source. That's my foundation. Because in our context, you know, many non-Christians have come to know, well, Christians do evangelism. They're going to come and preach the gospel. They're going to ask me to uh, give my life to Jesus. And, and so they, they think that there's some sort of ploy or some sort of manipulation. But when you, then they really see us living life and saying, we really do care about you. We're not here just for a short term. We're here, we're committed. And when we do life for them, many of my friends, before I could preach the gospel to them, before I could share about Christ, they have asked me, who is Christ to you? Where, how, why do you believe that there is salvation in Christ? And many of my friends have come to know the Lord as a result of that. And so I feel that's what the world is looking for, especially young people across the world. There's a desire for authenticity. There's a desire for people who are not posers. And when they see that, they would also see who Christ is. Thank you. The questions that we have are those that have been submitted by people ahead of time. So I want to come to Sarah now. And in a way, it's a similar kind of question. You know, it's inspiring to hear what Prashant says. It's really amazing to think, yes, the message is about building confidence. But mm. for you, Sarah, how, as we reimagine church with the impact of COVID, uh, and imagining how we are called to have an integral witness, word, deed, person, to the least, the last, and the lost. How are we going to do that? Well, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, it's not d different from uh, the comments that Prashman has made. It's about relationship and, and that, you know, Christians, churches are, this, are part of communities. Uh, and so that the need for us is to, to build communities with people. It, it is all relational. Um, but of course, it begins with our relationship with God. So we will only do that if in the first instance, we've taken care of our relationship with God, that we are confident that we are children beloved of him, that we've abided in him, that we've listened uh, to, to what he is calling us to do. So, so our relationship, first and foremost, is, is really important, but also then to live in our communities and to relate to them and uh, and I think I you know I see that at the moment churches are there in the communities they are providing food banks they are providing debt uh, relief they are relief they are uh, helping people not to feel lonely and exactly uh, what has been said that's what you do first and foremost and, and almost always people um but then ask you what your motivation is, or they come to you about, mm. uh, about your relationship with Christ and talk. Mm. Um, and, and we've talked about young people, and, and there's no doubt that, that life is hard for young people at the moment. And, and there are some really good examples in London here where churches uh, during the period have gone online with their youth groups. And, and actually what's fascinating um, is that people have turned up who probably wouldn't have turned up to a physical youth group. They, they've come in on the Zoom and, 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 and really creative, you know, uh, quiz nights, baking groups, you know, really creative ways that have just helped people uh, during what has been an isolating period. And that first and foremost, they've been called to care in, in deed. And actually out of that then comes the opportunity to talk about my faith and what motivates me. And, and I think that's, so start with our relationship with God and then relationships with other people. It's often said, isn't it, uh, Sarah, that crisis accelerates the changes that are already underway within a given situation. Now we have COVID that has really accelerated that. Yeah. So what do you see as the key changes in our society and church that COVID pandemic has accelerated and therefore that we need to think about continuing into the future? Um, I don't know. If it, I, I think what I mean, in, in a sense, one of the 
one of the it's you know I mentioned this one of the things it has done is it's shown us where some of our fault lines are so I do think it has to be a fire to us to speak against injustice there is no doubt in my mind that we can't allow the pandemic to pass and not to do something about those inequalities that we have seen and those because those that are most disadvantaged are being affected by lockdown and are being affected by COVID. And therefore we have to be prophetic and uh, speak into that. So I, I hope we don't lose um, that imperative to do that. But of course, the other thing it's done is it's made us think about what is church. Um, and you know we have seen this huge movement to using technology. And I do think going forward, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we've picked up that we want to keep? What is it that we need to put down? And what do we need to pick back up? Uh, and, uh, and I think we need to be, be clear about that. You know, um, I talk to people who suddenly have found that they're back into a small group, people doing Bible studies that have probably for, have forgotten about them for some years. Now, that would be great to carry on because actually it means you don't have to go out into the cold and the dark. You can do a Bible study online uh, with a group of people. But, but I don't think that replaces community. You know, I think we all at the moment, particularly in the UK, who are locked back down, you know, we miss community. We miss we miss that connectivity, um, and so I don't. And so there are some things that we will have. You know, we have to pick back up and help those who have come online to journey into that community. So a huge amount of learning around technology, but but good things. But but what we've missed is community. Thank you, and Prashant. Have you seen anything else? Anything else that's happened uh, around the world in your experience in terms of what has been accelerated? in this COVID pandemic that we could learn from and keep going? I think to a certain extent, um, a lot of social evils and brokenness in society, mm. uh, people have come to a point of not just acknowledging it, but having the time to really reflect on it. And, and uh, whether it's, you know, uh, the issues of racism, inequality, when it comes to access to healthcare or poverty, whatever it may be. So, so that reflection, I think, has led more people We've been broken away from the hustle and the bustle of day-to-day -day life to now reflect and now think of active ways to engage. And I hope that's something that will now manifest when things come back to normal, that we will not just now walk away from it. And that's, that's one. A second thing is that I really feel that the use of, of social media and the use of online technology is to continue to engage and, and have people um, you know, bridging with people that you usually wouldn't have, especially for the work that we do, bringing people who are enemies to come together. You know, it's, some, it's very hard to bring the enemies to come and be part of a residential experience with us or an in-person experience. But now we're having way more people online engaging with each other, you know, whether it's an Israeli or a Palestinian or a Tutsi or a Hutu, you know, all these different groups that you would, it would be hard to be, but you have these conversations. And I think those things have been accelerated and, and that's, those are things that we should continue to build upon. Can I follow up on that, Prashan? We, um, Sarah spoke very eloquently about the impact, particularly of Black Lives Matter, on the whole of the world. And we, we are absolutely shocked to the core when we look at ourselves and realize that there is a lot for us to all address, especially people like me that is white. What wisdom do you think, what help do you think that some of the lessons that we're learning in the pandemic, perhaps to do with IT connectedness, what could, what could help us find a pathway forward in this situation? Any wisdom for us all to share? Yes, I, I, was, um, I have the privilege of teaching a class on the theory and practice of peace building. I teach this uh, class in every summer in the US. Uh, and I always have the class of about uh, 10 African-American pastors and 10 Caucasian pastors taking this class together. So obviously they're passionate about this. They want to learn about it. Uh, it's an elective class. So they, they sign up and they're there. But every year I, I give them this assignment where I want them to write 10 people in your life who are kind of your inner circle. Like if, you're, if your son or daughter gets married, they're the 10 that you would bring in as your guests. You know? And so everybody writes that list. And then I ask them, would you please highlight anybody who is from a different race, uh, who tends to vote differently than you? who may be from a different religion or different socioeconomic background. And over the last four years, I've been amazed that the intersection has been almost less than 1%. Uh, 
most of the time people live in segregated bubbles. And, and as a result of that, it's not just like Bishop, Bishop said before, it's not just, um, it's easy to create negative stereotypes about the other and build uh, assumptions about the other, but it also makes us less empathetic for the pain and our common humanity. It deprives us of the opportunity to really celebrate that diversity and make our lives richer and to have more of a perspective and a broader worldview. So why would we do that to ourselves intentionally when we know that we can do something about it? So I really feel that when it comes to race, that's a huge challenge we're seeing. And I see that across the world where more and more people are becoming segregated. And unfortunately, in the United States, they say 11 a.m. on Sunday is still the most segregated hour of the entire week. And so, yes, we're worshiping, but even worshiping separately, not trying to find ways to engage, that I think is it's very dangerous. But at the same time, we have segregation, but then we also have the challenge of where we get our information and where we get our knowledge and our social media network. So on the social media front, social, uh, social media algorithms, just make sure that you, whatever you believe, whatever your opinions are, are solidified. They don't make you uncomfortable. It's like a safe church. They're not gonna preach any messages that makes you uncomfortable. So that makes sure that you keep on coming every Sunday. But this, the social media that was, it gives you only what you want to hear. So you don't hear any of the perspective. And then you, the media that you watch, it's just the type of media that will enforce what you believe. And on top of that, that gives you a false justification and a false sense of righteousness, a self-righteousness without being uncomfortable and saying, Lord, break me where I have to be broken and then be uncomfortable because we have to be molded. And that it's a painful process. And it, regardless of the color of your skin and where you want, we all have issues of, of racism. We all have issues of that. So go to the Lord every day and say, Lord, break me where I have to be broken. Don't let me comf be comfortable in this. And don't let me be part of the problem. And don't let me stand in the way of you bringing about healing and justice to our world. That's a very tough call, isn't it? To stand up and be ready to be broken. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Bishop Sarah, uh, another question that's come in from a... Uh, uh, somebody from probably from a member of the uh, the Church of England clergy, I think. Due to the pandemic in our diocese, we're looking at a significant financial shortfall uh, in the next few years. Strategically speaking, how does the church strike the balance between investing its resources innovatively in mission and in maintaining its traditional structures? What would you say to that mm -hmm. clergy person? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, as, as we talked, you know, COVID is is bringing forward challenges that may have taken a few years to have happened. So, so um, and one of those is going to be the the financial challenge everywhere, um, and and so there is a sense in which we, you know, I believe we have to face in into that into that really. Um, my belief is that the um, best solutions are always known locally. So, so there's something about how we listen to those uh, in the churches. I'm also a great believer that people uh, you know, don't come to Christ through structures, they come to Christ through individuals. Uh, and so, so therefore, what, whatever we do, we have to say, you know, it has to support uh, locally um, the, the local church. And I do think that, that, that as a, you know, the Church of England, probably like other churches, are going to have to face hard structures uh, sorry, hard questions about our structures, any of our structures, what they should do is facilitate the local church. Uh, but one of the great things about the Church, church of England, um, and a lot of independent house churches would recognise this, is actually there, there, is a, what, there is something positive about our structure, about accountability, about nurturing, about support. So, so for me, there is a balance to get with this. But, but I do think we have to ask some of the hard questions. Um, and so it's not one or the other. Uh, my, my vision slightly is that I think we're going to see a much more mixed model of the nature of church within the Church of England, particularly in the future. Uh, and I think that it, it's going to force something we should have done a long time ago and move away from a clerical model to one in which everybody is released for their ministry. Uh, and that means that uh, as, as a, an ordained member, I'm going to have to re-question my role because actually what we need is a church where where everybody flourishes and everybody has discerned what God is calling them to do. So, so I do think that the church, uh, church of England does need to change uh, what it looks like. Thank you very much. Well, we've, we're coming rapidly towards the end of our time together this evening. Uh, 
three words that jump out to me from all that both of you have said is relationship, confidence, and I'm using this word now, which is pivoting, really. How do we maintain those two things of relationship and confidence, but how do we really discover a new way forward, building on what has been, not just taking on everything else on top of us because we will be crushed, but actually building with confidence, with hope into the future. So thank you very much, uh, Bishop Sarah Malali and, uh, and our, our dear brother from Sri Lanka, uh, Prashanda Silva, Devisa, sorry, excuse me. Um, thank you very much, both of you. And I'm going to hand over to Emma just to tell us a bit more about how we can engage further in this. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, and uh, you can see on the uh, on the screen there, uh, just uh, telling you about uh, donations uh, uh, for a particular bursary fund that we would like to share with you today. But let's not talk about money for a moment. Let's look at the fact that actually what we've learned this, today and this evening echoes so much of what we were chatting about as a whole college community this morning when we looked at prejudice and discrimination in mission. And so we were not wanting to keep our eye off the ball in terms of sharing the gospel, but we knew that we came with certain prejudices. And so this um, bursary fund that we're launching today on reimagining mission is to encourage people who would not normally access a level of training that we can bring, bring uh, out to the world from here to come and join us either online or in a blended style of learning online and in person to come and study and to grow in their opportunity to, to understand the gospel and to do mission in where they're at. And we're doing that in a partnership way so we formed a partners with the world evangelical alliance with tear fund with new wine and with operation world and all those organizations are now looking for people that they can um, engage and see that this is a good opportunity for further training and development some of you might be thinking new wine isn't that uk based but as sarah said we're in a multicultural community we want to be intercultural we want to be integrated so that we all sit at the table, we have something to say, and we're heard. And so we're looking at what can be what can be an opportunity for training if you're based in the UK and around the world. So if you'd like to be a part of that, then do feel free to donate to that bursary. Thank you very much. Back to you, Andy. Thank you very much, Emma. Well, what a great uh, evening this has been. Uh, it's been quite uh, an amazing, uh, rich banquet and lots to think about further. We would really encourage you to email us your comments, uh, what's been good, what's been not so good, how we could improve next time, because we run these uh, webinars at different times of the year. We had a great series of reimagining church and mission back in uh, earlier in the year, in, uh, in April, in May, in June, and you can find all those on our YouTube channel if you wish. But also, we would love you to write to us and let us know. So please do email communications at allnations.ac.uk. We'd love your feedback um, uh, so that we can improve and do more in the future. I'd just also like to point out, if you're not already aware, you are warmly welcome to join us for our annual Carols from Easney, which is going to be uh, broadcast on YouTube on Wednesday, the 2nd of December at 7.30 p.m., it will also be broadcast on UCB1, uh, probably Christmas Eve, and it will be available afterwards. It's always a great way of starting the Christmas season, uh, the early part of Advent there, as we worship together, as we hear inspirational messages, and as we reflect on scripture, particularly from all around the world. This is a multicultural event, so you're very warmly welcome. Let's just close our time this evening in prayer. Let's just pray. Father God, thank you for our time. Thank you for the fact that we can gather across the world to really wrestle through these issues. Thank you, Lord, that you're helping us to contribute to the bigger conversation.
And thank you, Lord, that you've reminded us tonight that actually we need to be investing in relationships with one another and across all communities. And Lord, we ask for you to give us the confidence, the confidence, Lord, especially in these dark times when it is difficult. It is difficult to be able to do life in ways that we would love to do. We are many of us locked down across the world at this winter time, but we pray, Lord, for the light at the end of the tunnel, and we pray that we would pivot, that we would reimagine what it is to be a confident Christian in our world, to show your love, Lord, into our broken world, because we believe that the gospel, which is unchanging, is the hope for our world. And we thank you for being with us this evening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 